Uh, a couple of years ago, a bunch of us were talking, I think this was when we were all fired up about I don't know more, and uh, man, we were going to change the world for like two months, man, we were committed to dying if we had to, you know, and uh, anyway, the, the the incredible movement that we now know as I Don't Know More continues in many different uh, ways and the energy has shifted a little bit but the focus is still the same. And during that time, a number of things were said by a lot of people and a number of ideas, a number of dreams uh, were born uh, at that time. Uh, Chris Scribe, who is uh, one of the people that brought us here this afternoon and is one of those people that started to imagine doing something a little bit differently, trying to present something in maybe a little bit of a different way and try to share old ideas in a new and exciting forum such as this. He is our final speaker of the day, so please help me welcome Chris Scribe. Check. Ah. Okay. <laughs> now he's, I'm not related to him. I get mistaken for Ryan all the time, you know, and I, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I'm Ryan McMahon, I'm funny. <laughs> I'm a good guy, you know, I got a podcast, all that. <laughs> Travel all over, you know, good way. Dancer Gumagantik, prescribe Nagasiga, son. Kenaseo Sipi Uchinia. Hao Konabi, Togahe Amani Machiabi. Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to Think Indigenous Education Conference. I, uh, I'm humbled here today at the speakers that came before me and shared. In fact, you know, they said it all, so, you know, I'm done. <laughs> That's it. I'll, I'll shut her down. When we sat down and uh, talked about this conference, in conversations at a coffee, over, at a, over coffee, sitting down in corners and talking about the need to help our students in our school systems. We talk about it all the time. The talking part is the easy part. We can sit back in our schools and talk about the need to, for change, the need to do things differently, and a need to approach our students and get them to be successful. We have those conversations all the time. The most difficult thing to do is to put those words into action and get your feet on the ground and moving forward. I'm here today to share some stories with you. Now, I don't want to talk about my education system. And equally, you talked about that student that didn't make it in, in a first year of university, that's a reality. But that didn't, student didn't come to ITEP. <laughs> I just want to say that. 90% <laughs> success rate in ITEP, you know. Two, oh, 1,500 to 2,000 graduates, First Nation people, throughout the Northwest Territories in Saskatchewan and Alberta and Western Canada that are teaching our children. And we had Oris Morawski here who was instrumental in making that a success up until this time. And uh, now it's going downhill because I, I got the gig to take it over. So, so oh no, <laughs> just kidding, it's going to be good still. Uh, <laughs> but I'm here to share, I'm going to share with you some stories. Now, I didn't always plan on being a teacher. I didn't always plan that way. It just sort of happened. And I believe that the path is laid before us, each of us that are here. There's a path laid before us, and it's us to choose if we want to walk that way. Now, my musham, his name was uh, Murdo Scribe, and he was a hunter, fisher, trapper in northern Manitoba, and accumulated a PhD-level knowledge of the land. And with that knowledge, they moved out of Keneseo CP, Sipa Stick, where is our trap line, moved out of there into Portage del Prairie, Manitoba. And he worked in a, in a boiler room, but on a side gigs, he was a gig master. And what he did in this gig master life, I know a lot of really great people, my brother Donnie here is one of them. In this gig master life, you go and share your knowledge with people. 
Now, my Musham had a grade six education from a residential school, an industrial school. And that isn't, a, that isn't an education. That's not what that is. That's not what that was. But my Musham traveled into schools in Manitoba, sharing his knowledge of the land, sharing his knowledge and stories that he learned from, from my ancestors, and sharing them with children. Children. Not specifically indigenous children, but all children. And he shared those stories with them and shared the teachings that go along with different things that he created, and he went in there and did that. He went on to create and write a children's book, Murdo's Story, talking about a legend of Fisher and, and, the, and the differentiation of how we split up our seasons. Now, he did this. Now, my mushroom passed away when I was three years old. And little did I know that at that time, that was going to be an integral path, a laid out path for me moving forward. Now, after high school, I went to school on the res. You know, I graduated on the res. And after, you know, I, I wanted to make Suniel. I wanted to make cash. That's what I wanted to do. I thought that was important. So I tried tree planting. You know, yeah, out there, you know, you get there and there's a big haze of smoke, you know. It's not fires. That's uh, hippies. You know, they're all tree planting there. <laughs> Wasn't my scene, you know. <laughs> Took my tent down, you know. Ooh, uh, you know, Cookham wouldn't approve of this. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, I went and I worked on another place where uh, you make a lot of money, and that's the oil rigs. And three weeks working tree planting, I made more on Canada Day working on the rigs than I did those three weeks of tree planting. So you make a lot of money killing the earth and not much saving it. That's what I learned from there. But when I was on the rigs, I, I had conversations with non-native people. And these conversations taught me a lot of different things. Because you don't get very much more racist or ignorant than the people in an isolated uh, rig north of Grand Prairie. <laughs> you don't. It's rough. And a young Aboriginal a young First Nation, a Cinnaboyne Cree, proud person going into this situation, I had to develop a thick skin. I did. Because every name in the book, it doesn't matter what it is, I got called that. Because their main goal is to run you off. And their thoughts about indigenous people weren't right. They weren't good. And I changed the way they thought about indigenous people. Pretty soon, they were like saying, holy smokes, Chris, you're different. You know, you work hard, you're funny, you know, you don't party around like, holy man, you're not in jail. You're different. And I thought, you know what, all my friends, they're like me. All my friends are like me. The people who are different are the ones that you see and are portrayed in our media. And we had these conversations daily. Pretty soon, when new people would come on and try that same type of attitude, these non-native people would defend. Hey, 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 no, that's not what indigenous people do. And it gives me hope that we can open up our minds and change that thought. Now, back to stories. So, winter time, I come back, it's Christmas, and I get a phone call from my cousin. There's a seat open in Thunderchild. Uh, Thunderchild had an ITEP program. It was the first one since 1974. They had one in Palmaker and Little Pine, and they redid this in, in 2001 in Thunderchild. One seat open, and come check it out. Come on, Chris, it'll be good. Uh, okay, so I went. And, uh, you know, 9750 is what I got for welfare every two weeks. And that's what got me in that first year in Thunderchild. But while I was out there, I thought, this is important for us. You know, I need to give back to these communities in which I got so much from. And I went back after my B. Ed. I went and taught, I went, finished it in Saskatoon. And I went back into, uh, 
into Sas- I went back into Thunderchild and taught for a year, and I went back to teach again in, in Palm Maker. And I taught every grade from grade two to grade nine. And while I was in there, that's my most favorite job is to teach. That's my most favorite job. I love it. I mean, sometimes, yeah, you're like, oh, bloody hell. These kids, man, they're driving me crazy. Driving home, you know, stressing out. We all did it. If you're a teacher, you did it. Like, oh, man, you know, geez, that little, oh, you're awesome. Yeah, I love you. Um, <laughs> that happened, you know, that, that's, re- that's real. You know, but I loved it because you got to make a difference with those children. You got to see something happen with them, a great thing, you know. But what I realized quickly is that only happened in my classroom. When I walked outside that class, I didn't see that happening in the other classes. I seen people stressed out of lack of resources. I seen people stressed out of their socioeconomic issues. I seen all of that stuff happening. And I said, you know what? We don't need to have that. That doesn't need to be how it is. You know, so let's do the principal gig, I thought. You know, that will be a good gig, you know. I'll do a principal gig. So I had the honor and privilege of going to my relatives in the Mosquito Grizzly Bear's Head Lean Man First Nation. And I went there and made a promise and a vow to my musham that I was going to change the way I thought about how education looks because I was now in a position to make a difference. I was now in a position to inspire teachers to think indigenous when they're in their classrooms. Because when we, when not we, when our people, our leaders, when they talked about Indian control of Indian education in 1969, their sole purpose for our schools on our reserves, in our nations, in our small countries within Canada, their purpose was to have First Nation people teaching the culture, language, and traditions specific to that nation in which you're teaching. That was the purpose of it. But somehow that changed and went into something else. And we decided that we're going to mirror provincial school systems. Well, to me, that wasn't okay. And the numbers, I'm not talking about the numbers, but the numbers are terrible. I'm sick and tired of them. Because those are not, I'm not reading a, a research report. Those are my people. Those are my people. And that's not okay. So when I had this chance to do this, I kept in mind that it's important to incorporate indigenous knowledges and approach that as an Indian first. And all the other stuff can come after because we haven't done that justice yet. Now, it's not easy. It's difficult. And not one person can do that. I, I, show me that person. That person is Mamu Tawimau. That's, you know, our grandfathers. That's who can do that, not a human being. You need guidance to do that. And where do you look for guidance? And I think about my musham. Well, my musham could have sat at a table and taught me how to educate the children of Norway House Cree Nation. Why am I not asking the elders of Mosquito, Grizzly Bears, Head, Lean Man, First Nation, and how to do this? So what we did was we sat around in our culture programs and our language programs in our schools for a lot of our schools have become dumping grounds for people to send their preps to. And our language teachers are stressed out because the kids go there and they're just like all over the place. And a language and a culture program should not be a prep. A language and a culture program should be the heart of our indigenous schools. That's what should be at the center. So we went in there, we went into our school system, and I said, I asked our board, I said, can I do what I want to do? And and much like Evan, they gave me freedom. You know, it didn't really matter anyway. You know, I could get a job somewhere else. You know, I'll go, you know, go back and teach kindergarten. I never tried that. Just getting to drive me crazy, the kindergartens. I wouldn't be able to handle this. That little Johnny, you have to wipe his bum today. Yeah, just kidding. (laughs) But no... So I asked them, and they gave me the, the, the opportunity to work. So I brought in our elders group within our, within our school. Not just me. I mean, I had help. 
I had help with a lady here by the name of Sylvia Weenie. I had help from uh, Jenny uh, Spyglass, who was the elder at our school. And we brought in our elders, and we sat around this table, and I asked them, I said, what do you want your children to know and remember and retain when we're and you are gone from this earth? What do you want your kids to know? Answer me in your language. Don't answer me in English. Because our elders and our first language speakers, they think in Cree, they think in Assiniboine, and when they translate that into English, stuff gets lost. So I asked them to reply all of those 10 people in their language. And they all went around and they all shared wonderful, powerful messages. And I wrote all of these messages on a board. We had a translator and everybody told me how to do this. And I wrote them all down and those 10 elders within a two hour span embodied every single outcome and indicator from grade kindergarten to grade eight. Every single thing was touched on and everything was a part of that in two hours. That's a genius in my book because I don't know how long it took Saskatchewan to make their curriculum, but I guarantee it took a hell of a lot longer than two hours. Those elders did it. Those elders were able to do that if you asked the right questions. So what our plan was from there was to take all of those outcomes and indicators, bring our teachers in for our staff meetings, and plan our years around that. What did the elders say to teach there? Which indicator for your grade level matches with that? And go all the way around in a circle. I got a funny story about a year plan. You know, my principal at the time is up there, Lester Pavel. You're, you're going to laugh at this. But I had a year, we had to do these year plans, all of us teachers. Linear year plans, very colonial year plans. September till June. All of these things need to be on here on this nice, beautiful chart. And I need to hand this into my principal and then get it done. Well, I bought a year plan. I bought a year plan off a teacher, and I changed, I whited out the name, and I, I wrote, yeah, I can say this now, you know, Lester, it doesn't matter. So I, I, I did that, I photocopied it, I doctored it up, and I, I stapled that thing behind my desk on a, on, a, on, a, on a nice little board and doctored it up. Oh, it looked nice. Pretty soon I was sharing that at the staff meeting because it was so good. Right? But we do that, we staple those things up and put them on there, and then maybe we follow it, maybe we don't. But that's not our system as Indigenous people. Our system is based on our seasons. Our system is circular, it's, a, it's round. So why are we not planning that way with our students? Now, we did that with there, then I left. You know, sorry, Lori, I mean, I, I feel bad, I had to leave because this ITEP gig came off, on, and I wanted to get taxed so bad, you know, because uh, getting taxed is awesome, you know. I don't like that, working on the reserve business, you know. You know, There's too much money, you know, it goes up here, yeah. <laughs> oh, my friends up there, you know. It's okay, you know, you can come get taxed if you want. Yeah. Yeah, so, <clears throat> oh, yeah, oh, humble, yeah. So we went. So, you know, our plan was to implement these and moving forward. You know, and then I come back to uh, the vow I made to my grandfather. I, uh, I never had an opportunity to have a conversation with him about education. I never had that chance. I never had the chance to sit down and tell him that I respected what he did. I never had that opportunity, you know. So I made a promise to him. I made a promise to him and piggybacking off my brother Colby, I made a promise to him that I'm going to do everything I can for Ind Indian kids to succeed. Every single possible thing that I can within my being of my life, I'm going to try. Because one day, I'm going to have an opportunity to have a conversation with my musha. And I'll be gone, I'll take my last breath here on earth. And I believe this with all my heart and soul. And I want to say to him, Musham, I did everything I could. Now I'm standing here before you today as human beings. And I can stand here and bullshit to you and make this sound good. Because talking is easy. 
But I can't bullshit my mushroom when I meet him. So the message I want to leave with you today, the message I want from this conference, is for each of you to find that person that you cannot bullshit. Find that person that you can go back to your classrooms and you cannot lie to. To say that I did everything possible for indigenous kids to succeed. That's what you have to do. If we can do that, if we can find that, whatever form that takes, whatever shape that is, if it's a vow to ourselves, then the possibilities are endless. Because right now, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we teach in our school. This is the knowledge in which we teach. And indigenous knowledge is over here. And if we call ourselves educators, we owe it to our children to give them this. And that is within your grasps and the communities in which you teach. And our children will benefit from that. I know it right here. And I've heard a theme talked about, a theme about our heart. And I also heard a theme about our grandmothers. And I want to take this time right now to uh, share with you. Um, I wouldn't be here today without my grandmother. And I wouldn't be here today without her. So this talk is dedicated to her. She's no longer here with us. So I wanted to say that at this time. And I wish you all a great, great day. And may whatever you heard here reach you and you remember it when you go. Because I've been to many conferences. I don't remember everything that I went to. But I hope this is different. And that you get something here and it inspires you to think indigenous when you're in your classrooms. When we're in our schools and when we're leading our schools. Because our kids need that. Hi, hi. Nanaskum tinawao. Oh,